Support for Conversations Live comes from the Gertrude J. Sant Endowment, the James H. Olay Family Endowment, and the Sidney and Helen S. Friedman Endowment. And from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to WPSU's Conversations Live, Gambling in Pennsylvania. I'm Ann Danahy, coming to you live from the Dr. Keiko Miwa-Ross WPSU Production Studio. Gambling is a growing business and pastime in Pennsylvania, along with traditional casinos and online gaming are mini casinos, including one proposed for State College. While the industry is generating record-breaking revenues, there are questions about mental health and safety. Joining us to discuss that and answer your questions are three people with different perspectives on the topic. Glenn Sterner is an assistant professor of criminal justice at Penn State Abington and a faculty member with the Criminal Justice Research Center at Penn State. Amy Hubbard is the drug and alcohol program manager of the Compulsive Problem Gambling section in the Pennsylvania Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs. Eric Pearson is the founder of Copper Star Gaming, a gaming consulting firm. He has extensive experience running casinos, including in Pennsylvania. You too can join tonight's conversation. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242. Our email address is connect at wpsu.org. Well, thank you to all three of you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having, for having us. us. Thank you. Total gaming revenues in Pennsylvania were up 33% this October compared to a year ago. Eric Pearson, as someone who has worked in the industry, what do you think is behind that? Do you see this as a, a short-term upswing? People were spending a lot of time at home last year. Obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic meant that things were getting canceled. The casinos were actually shut down for a little while in Pennsylvania. So is it a, a short-term upswing, or do you see it as a long-term shift? Yeah, the, the October figures specifically are definitely very impacted by uh, by COVID. So as you mentioned, uh, last October, um, I think the entire industry were shut down for portions and there were uh, properties, I think, in and around the Philly area that were closed for the entire month. So I, I think a, a big piece of that difference and that huge number increase was definitely a, a short-term effect that was due to COVID. Do you see any of it, though, a longer range in Pennsylvania as the industry swinging up? Yeah, it's, I, we're seeing it in Pennsylvania and we're seeing it um, nationwide, really, too. Uh, the industry has been uh, has recovered pretty significantly and, uh, and, and a lot of states are seeing record revenue figures, Pennsylvania included. And so it'll, it'll be remain to see how, how permanent that is, though, right? Right. right. We'll have to check back next year and see if it's continuing <laughs> in that upswing or if it's kind of plateaued. Amy Hubbard, on the other side of that, with the increase in popularity of casinos and online gaming as well, is your office seeing an increase in demand for services, people who need treatment? Um, well, we haven't seen an increase in uh, admissions to treatment as far as what the state's covering. Uh, we don't have the numbers for any individuals who enter treatment, maybe through their insurance. So I only have the figures for people that we pay for. But um, what we did see is a huge increase to the helpline of calls, people calling in now that now they're reporting since COVID that interactive gaming is the main issue that they're having. Whereas prior to COVID, uh, slot machines were the big problem that everyone was calling the helpline for. And when they call that helpline, is it just a temporary way to talk to someone to help them through a, a one moment or do they get referred to services? How does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. When you call 1-800-GAMBLER, you're connected to um, a professional who understands, you know, uh, problem gambling. They're going to talk to you about what uh, what's going on. And then they're going to connect you with all different kinds of resources. That's going to be financial assistance. Um, there's 12 step groups. There's also printed materials they can send you online materials. And then they're also going to offer you treatment with a gambling certified counselor. So uh, once you they can connect you live to a counselor and get you an appointment or they can just give you the information you can call at your own convenience. 
And we took a look at that number right there that people can call the 24-hour helpline 1-800-GAMBLER. You can also go online, pacouncil.com slash helpline. If you have questions about that, if you're concerned about yourself or you're concerned about someone else. And Glenn, that's something that you're actually doing some research into and taking a look at, looking at online gaming and gambling. Can you tell us a little bit about the research that you're doing and what you're trying to find out? Yeah, you know, happy to talk about this this project, and it's actually with Amy's office. Uh, Penn State and uh, the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs are conducting an assessment of the prevalence of online gambling and interactive gaming. Uh, again, we use those terms kind of interactively, uh, depending on who you're talking to uh, within the industry. But uh, essentially what you're talking about is all of those electronic versions of our table games, slots, uh, sports betting, those types of things that you can access through either your PC, through the internet, or through your smartphone, through an app, uh, and even sometimes even in, in brick and mortar experiences where it's more of the, the electronic version uh, where you're trying to do that online. And so what we've seen is that uh, because of the really forward thinking legislation that allowed uh, interactive gaming and online gambling to be legalized here in Pennsylvania, part of that legislation provided for this assessment to understand how it's impacting Pennsylvanians. And that each year is paid for through uh, the revenues uh, from those who are certificate holders of those who are providing online and interactive gaming. And I think that that's a really great opportunity for us to monitor as we see this policy shift over time. And so from our perspective, that uh, the work that we're doing with uh, the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs, we're able to now take a look at what is happening currently, but also really excited to be able to understand how this is impacting us into the future. Can you give us an example of what type of impact you're talking about? What types of questions are you trying to answer? Absolutely. So one of the biggest pieces that we're trying to understand is how many people are actually engaged in online and interactive gaming. And what we're finding is that approximately one in 10 Pennsylvanians are engaged in this activity. Uh, the most popular of all of the options for people to engage in are uh, sports betting. We've seen that actually uh, not surprisingly grow in uh, revenue across the Commonwealth. And we also recognize that there's uh, the second most uh, popular is uh, table games. So things like uh, roulette, baccarat, uh, poker, those types of things. And we're going to go to a question here in a minute, but I just I have to ask. So the the timing of this, Glenn, is it just coincidental that it happened to be when the COVID nineteen pandemic hit and people are spending more time at home? No, this is not coincidental. So uh, I mean, it, actually, it is coincidental. So this was not on purpose. It was what I meant to say. Uh, we this came online. Uh, interactive gaming came online really. Uh, 2018, 2019 is when we first started to see the first. Uh, uh, offering of this opportunity for people to engage in this uh, activity across the Commonwealth, but it really came online in full, uh, more so in 2020. And that's when we began the actual assessment of the prevalence of uh, online gambling, and we're going to continue to do that in the future. It just so happened that uh, this was also the time when the world uh, <laughs> contracted the COVID-19 virus. Right. And we are going to go to our first question. And we got this question from Robert and he sent us an email. And Robert writes, in a casino, the odds are stacked so that in the long run, the casino comes out ahead. What will happen to the winnings? Will this money flow out of the area? Who exactly will get it? And I'm suspecting that Robert is probably referring to the proposed casino here in Center County in the State College area. And I know um, that one is still under review by the State Gaming Control Board. But maybe, Eric, you could speak to generally the idea if a casino goes into an area, is there a way of measuring how much of the revenue stays in the area in the form of, of jobs and, and revenues and projects and then how much might end up going out of the area? Yeah. I and mean, you have, you know, the, you have the tax revenue, which in, in Pennsylvania on slots is 54%. Um, and that goes, you know, directly back to the Commonwealth and is redistributed. Um, uh, but also, too, you know, after those tax payments are done, uh, I mean, the casino has to pay all of its other expenses. So payroll uh, and benefits is by far, after the gaming tax, is by far the largest, um, the largest expense for these casinos. And um, depending on the size of the operation, you know, the, the larger casinos in the state can employ thousands uh, of casinos. Uh, in my time at Valley Forge, we had over a thousand employees and we were a relatively small operation. 
Um, and even the smaller category four casinos, these you know mini or satellite casinos that are being developed throughout the state, um, they tend to have between 350 to 450, almost 500 employees, and they're the smallest ones. And those employees all live in the that local community. So, um, you know, it could be uh, after the taxes are paid, you know, 40 to 50 percent uh, of those revenues do go directly back, and that's directly payroll. Um, then there's all of the other services, equipment, um, you know, uh, everything from uh, the groceries for the, the restaurants to uh, all the mechanicals, utilities. I mean, all those things go directly back into the local uh, the local communities. That, that's great information to have. And we have another call here, and this is from Justin in State College. Hi, Justin, you're on the line. Do you have a, a question or comment? Hi, Justin, are you on the line? Well, we might have lost Justin. We'll see if, if he gives us a, a call back. But Eric, so you were talking about the amount of revenue that comes in. I want to mention that again, more than 50% of the revenue that comes in from the slot machines actually goes back to the state. Is that right? That's correct. And it's in the form, a lot of it, a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it goes to property tax relief. Yeah. On the... Eric, I also wonder if you could talk about uh, the other side of the concerns and questions that we were hearing. And so people might be concerned about addiction. Obviously not everyone who enjoys going to casinos, enjoys online gambling, is going to become addicted to it or have a dependency with it. But for skeptics out there who are concerned about a casino coming into their area or it expanding more broadly across the state of Pennsylvania, what would you say to those concerns? Um, I think specifically for Pennsylvania, you know, the, the casino industry is definitely a very mature one in the state. I think we have 15 casinos actively operate, operating throughout the state. Um, and, and so it's, it's you know, uh, a very established industry. I know, um, you know, concerns about problem gambling specifically uh, in, in all of my time in the industry and, and all of the uh, data and training uh, data I've seen and training that I've been through personally, um, you know, I think the uh, percentage of casino customers that, you know, do deal with problem gambling is in the very, very low single digits, you know, a couple percent of the overall number. So it, it's a rare thing. But, you know, that's just because it's a small percentage doesn't mean that we don't take it very seriously. Uh, I think the industry takes it incredibly seriously and our regulators and, um, you know, every casino employee goes through extensive training on uh, how to uh, assist people that identify that they may have a gambling problem. Um, every single piece of advertising or collateral from a, a brochure to a TV commercial to a billboard, uh, we include the 1-800-GAMBLER messaging on there. Um, if you, uh, there's uh, brochures throughout the casino. I mean, we, we really, you know, I think more than any other industry I could think of, um, really embrace and work very hard to assist folks that, that, you know, may be struggling. Right, and some of the revenue from the casino industry does actually go to support the programs that Amy and Glenn are involved with. Amy, is that where the, your office gets the revenue? And you, can you tell us a little bit about how your office got started and what it's looking at doing in the upcoming year? Yeah, sure. Um, that, yeah, all of our uh, funding for our prevention and treatment programs for problem gambling in Pennsylvania come from gaming revenue. Uh, none of it comes from taxpayer money. And uh, our department has um, our compulsive problem gambling section, which um, is three full-time staff that work on prevention and treatment programs in Pennsylvania, always trying to expand what we offer. Um, in our prevention programs, we uh, fund the county drug and alcohol offices that run prevention programs in their communities. They go into schools and senior centers and out in the community to raise awareness about problem gambling. And then we also have the treatment side where uh, we fund treatment for any Pennsylvania who Pennsylvanian or their family members who need treatment and they have no way to pay for it, regardless of their income. Um, if they do not have insurance or they're underinsured, we will cover their treatment. So is that something that somebody can find out again uh, by calling that 800 number or reaching out to your office online? 
Yes, uh, through 1-800-GAMBLER. And right. that's how they get access. And Glenn, what drew you to wanting to do this research? Obviously, it's very timely, but you've done other research areas in the past. You've looked at opioids in Pennsylvania and the impact that they've had. How did you come upon this? Yeah, this is an interesting and important uh, public health issues within our communities. I, it's, much of my work is at the intersection of criminal justice and public health and finding ways to work on the you know, most serious issues across the Commonwealth. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we've had a really great relationship and, and partnership with the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs through that work previously. Uh, you know, problem gambling issues associated with uh, interactive gaming moving forward. Uh, these are big questions that we need to be monitoring. We need to make sure that we have an understanding of, and frankly, we need to make sure that we're utilizing data to drive the work that we are doing in our communities. And so uh, when we saw this opportunity, we frankly were really excited to be able to, uh, as, a, in a, as an institution, uh, work with the state as well as communities across the Commonwealth to take on this uh, as we see fit. Well, if you're just joining us, I'm Ann Danahy, and this is WPSU's Conversations Live. Tonight, we're talking about gambling and casinos in Pennsylvania, and we're ready to take your calls. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242. You can also send us questions by email at connect at WPSU.org. So Amy, can you talk about that, what you will do with those findings from the research when the information starts to come in? How will that help your office? Well, the research um, on problem gambling has always been lacking, not just in Pennsylvania, but uh, nationwide, even international. So the more data we can collect, the more we can focus on how to help people. Um, the more data we have on what's going on in Pennsylvania, the more we can target certain populations or certain age groups and make effective prevention and treatment programs and give more opportunities to individuals who need them. So we can focus things better if we have more data. And I wondered also too, if we could talk a little bit, Eric, about kind of the other side to that. So you're someone who has worked in the gambling and casino industry. You must obviously look at it as something that's fun, something that people enjoy doing is a, a healthy pastime, something to do for entertainment value. What do you, what draws you to the industry and how do you address those concerns that people have coming at it from the other side? Yeah, it's um, I've I've worked in this industry my whole life, uh, and and I've even attempted to leave a couple of times, and it, it never takes. Um, it, it is exciting. It is fun. It's um, it, it's it's fun to you know. There's a lot of action. People are having a good time, and it's it's the entertainment business. Um, and and the vast 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 majority of people that um, come through our doors uh, are there to enjoy themselves. And, uh, and we, love, uh, we love providing those experiences. Do you think that, the, that there was a, a stigma associated with it at all and that that's gone away over time? Or do you think that there's still, do you get pushback for it? Yeah, I think that, you know, as, as casino gaming has sort of expanded throughout the country over the past, uh, you know, a few decades really, um, that it has, the stigma has has definitely gone away. I've I've been in the industry for uh, about 25 years now, and and there definitely was like a much more um, you know you would you would say that you worked in a casino or something, and people would be oh really like that's uh, you know that's so interesting that that's like kind of an exciting thing, and they would ask you you know questions from old movies they saw and things like that. Um, nowadays, when I tell people that I work in the casino industry, they go, "Oh, that's interesting." I you know I have a cousin who's a dealer, or I have you know family members who do this or or, or that that around the industry. So I, I just think it's very familiar now. Um, uh, a lot of people have been to casinos. Um, both in destination markets and locally, and, and it's, it's not probably as sensational as it once was. Well, I spoke with Doug Harbach, Communications Director with the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board, about some of the topics that we've been talking about earlier this week. So we're just going to take about 10 minutes to hear what he had to say on some of these issues, and then we'll come back to talk about it. Doug Harbach, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. 
Casinos in Pennsylvania generate a lot of revenue, and some of that money goes to the state, too. We're talking about $172 million in tax revenue in October alone. Can uh-huh. you give us an idea of where that tax money goes? Yeah, most homeowners need to know that that uh, the bulk of that, probably a, a good 60% of the total revenue, goes toward general property tax relief. Um, all too often, a lot of citizens, as I go around the state, don't know they're getting that because they have to look at their tax bill, uh, their school tax bill, and make sure that they see the homestead exclusion or homestead credit on there. That's the slot machine money that was promised them. And uh, depending on their school district, they'll see uh, anywhere from uh, $100 and $200, maybe as high as $600 deducted off their bill. So that's the biggest part of it. While there also is a good bit of money that goes uh, into the into the horse racing industry, that's important because we're still uh, see agriculture as a, as a top industry in Pennsylvania, and a lot of goods and services are bought because of that, and a lot of jobs are created. And also, um, then money trickles down into uh, some of the communities that uh, host casinos, economic development projects. So um, right now, we're looking at uh, probably over $2 billion in 2021 of uh, revenue coming from uh, taxes for the games that we regulate. So $2 billion in tax revenue alone, is that record setting for Pennsylvania? It will be. Uh, We have uh, seen a a renaissance in some ways of the uh, revenue that's being generated in Pennsylvania. Some of that's because of the addition of new forms of gaming. That includes uh, internet gaming for uh, casino type games. It also uh, involves sports wagering. And um, we also, I think because of, uh, of COVID and uh, the, the downturn in business at the land-based casinos, in large part because of safety measures and also even closures for a while, a lot of individuals who like that form of entertainment seem to be wanting to get out of the house and back to the casinos where we're seeing some uh, real record levels of play uh, at the, uh, currently at the 15 casinos in Pennsylvania. So gambling is creating a lot of revenue, it's creating jobs as well, but it does have problems. And I want to focus on one in particular, the issue of people leaving children in their cars while they're going in the casino. So they're leaving the kids in the parking lot or a hotel room while they're going in the casino. How big of a problem is this? Is this something that's happening all the time? Well, it, it's happening way too frequently. Even one time is too many times. I think we'll, um, not to defer that this is not an issue that's important to the uh, to us as regulators for casino industry, but there are uh, a lot of bad parents and guardians out there, and they leave their kids in cars, not only at casinos, but other venues. Well, in particular at casinos, we have seen uh, around 132 cases over the last 11 years of, of these issues. They're occurring about 90% of the time in the parking lots where individuals will leave a child or two or sometimes three children in a vehicle while they go in and gamble. Um, and that's just not acceptable. One of our uh, board members, Sean Logan, uh, has uh, in particular brought this up uh, at all of our board meetings over the last year or two. And uh, toward that end, it has crescendoed to make sure that the casinos now are paying a, a particularly close attention to it. It's not the kind of thing that they want to have happen either. And uh, in one case with the Valley Forge Casino, they have already committed $776,000 to uh, a program to mitigate this issue. So um, one of the things that the board is afraid of is if we don't nip this in the bud soon, that there will be a tragedy. We have avoided that so far um, and parents have been arrested. Parents have been in every case with the Gaming Control Board placed on an exclusion list So they no longer can go into a casino in Pennsylvania. They are banned. And uh, that is just one of the byproducts of of this this bad endeavor on their part. Right, because if casinos are becoming more popular, it seems like it could become more of a problem. Whose responsibility is it? Is it up to the casino operators to make sure they're looking in the parking lots to make sure that there aren't kids being left in the cars? Yeah, it's all of our responsibility. Um, The casinos in particular, Uh, have made uh, measures that have uh, already identified a lot of parents that have left children in cars. They have uh, uh, continual security that's roving around in the parking lots or parking garages, and they have found that. So again, they do not want that publicity, but let me just be very clear. 
in the end, it is the parent and guardian who is the responsible party. They have to be smarter about this. Um, they have plenty of time to go gaming. They have opportunities if they want to go gaming to get someone to watch their children. This is just not acceptable to be able to leave them in a car or in a hotel room or in a food court and then go game. I want to talk about one other topic here. There has been a casino that's been proposed for Center County, and it's still under review. And I know you can't get into discussing how that review process will play out. But I wondered if you could kind of give us a big picture idea. If it is approved, what would that mean for the State College area? Well, this is an interesting project, as are um, a couple of the other ones going on in the state. We had thought that we were possibly done with opening casinos a number of years ago, and the legislature decided they wanted to do these uh, satellite casinos of the current casinos, or otherwise known as mini casinos. Um, so we opened up an auction process, and, and candidly, uh, it was pretty successful. We had five um, uh, applicants paying anywhere from $50 million to $7.5 million for these licenses. And the state college, the college township project, um, is falling into lockstep with a couple of the other projects in that it is going to be in a uh, a, a mall that has, you know, lost a lot of business. We've done, we've seen this in Westmoreland County and York County, and uh, the early reports on that that has done some great reinvigoration of that facility. In the case of uh, the the project in College Township, uh, while that is still not quite ripe for the board for their um, vote on issuing a license, uh, it's still under review. But the plans there are to have somewhere around 350 to 400 jobs that would come from uh, that facility. Uh, it would have 750 slot machines. It would have 30 to 40 table games, a sports book, restaurant. And, as in, and in the end, it's going to also produce uh, millions of dollars annually of revenue, not only for Center County, but also for College Township. And on the flip side of the revenue are the concerns, again, about people with gambling addiction problems. It's close to a university. Could alcohol play a role in problem behavior? There are a lot of concerns that have been raised. And I wondered if you could generally comment about how much consideration the board gives that public feedback, the letters that it's been getting when it's making a decision. Every one of the board members uh, not only uh, are able to uh, be at or uh, or review all of the hearings that we had in College Township to hear all the public comments, but they also uh, have a record of all of the information coming to us, not only for those against it, but also for it. And uh, they will weigh that individually as they look at what is in the best interest of not only the Commonwealth, but also what's in the best interest of the community. Uh, these are decisions that Candidly, uh, uh, many people think are just a slam dunk, um, but they are looked at very closely. I can, uh, on my many years here, I've been here 15 years, uh, there was a project uh, a couple times that was attempted in the town of Gettysburg, and uh, many thought that, you know, it's, it's going to go there, but the board looked at it and looked at it and thought that was not a good location for a casino on two occasions. So, um, yes, the board will is looking at every bit of information that comes in here, and then they will uh, have a public vote on that in the near future. Doug Harbach, Director of Communications for the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you very much for the time that you've given to this important subject. And everyone, have a great holiday season. We did get a, a question that we're going to get to in a minute, but before we do that, Eric, I wondered if you could kind of address generally that issue of adults leaving kids in cars or hotel rooms while they go into casinos. Obviously, that's not something that the casino operators would probably want to see happen either. How is that addressed? Yeah, it, it's, it'd be hard to improve upon uh, the comments Mr. Harbaugh made. Um, I, I think that this is an issue that we're pretty much lockstep in the industry with, um, with the regulators in the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board. Um, I know that uh, I'm a parent myself, and um, it's something that I personally would take very, very seriously uh, as a casino operator. And, um, and and we all do. Um, we do significant patrols. You know, providing a, a very safe and secure environment is not only the right thing to do because it's the right thing to do. It's also 
you know, for if you're a casino operation, it's, it's very much a, a, almost a competitive advantage. So you, you want to have um, regular patrols in the parking lot. You want to make sure that when people come to the casino, they feel um, safe. And, and, you know, by having surveillance in the parking lots, by having regular patrols, we do that. And, and all those measures um, also assist to, to combat this issue, too. But, you know, we, we also you know, take this very seriously. Right. Yeah. And you also don't want to have problems feeling in the community that your community is thinking that you're not caring about these issues. So there's kind of the, the public relations side of it as well, I'm, I'm sure. We did get this question, and I'm going to see if I can sum it up a little bit. A casino sells entertainment with multiple impacts on the community, and those impacts are not immediately transparent. Given the steep but hidden price that the community must shoulder for this venture, is it fair to saddle it with these expenses so that developers can enjoy the profits while the community pays for supporting the venue? So concerns about a, a new casino coming to town. I don't know uh, which one of you wants to jump in on this. Is it, is it fair for members of the public, in your opinions, to be concerned about some of the downsides or negatives to a casino coming in? And we've talked a little bit about that, how to address that. But I just wondered if any of you want to jump in on that, those concerns that a casino will bring negatives with it, as well as the positives of jobs and revenue. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's crazy that that people are concerned. I mean, you know, uh, especially if it's a community that you know hasn't been close to a casino or things like that. I know. I think that uh, Pennsylvania, in in particular, and and the state legislature um, have have done a great job in in setting out a framework and and the laws of how regu regulated and taxed um, to make sure that benefits don't only go you know directly to um, central funds within the state, but that they do go and are, you know, flowed right back to those communities that host those casinos um, to address exactly what I think the, the, the point that the person who wrote in uh, brought up. It, you know, it's, it's, it's built in structurally to make sure that those revenues do flow back and, and are able to mitigate any impacts that could affect those communities. Thank you. And we have a call now, and this is from Joan in State College. Hi, Joan. Thank you for calling. And do you have a question or comment? I have a comment. Uh, I have a son who's a gambling addict, and he was invited after a wedding to go to a casino when he was still a minor, um, managed to get some false ID and got in, and he had his first experience there. Uh, and he discovered that he was an addict, and he has been... Um, an addict ever since. Um, I'm very concerned about having a casino in a place where there are thousands of college students um, who, if they hadn't had their first casino experience, uh, might even never know that they were addicts. Um, and I'm sure that they will uh, get false documentation to show that they are of age. And uh, this is going to really detract from their college experience, which they're here to learn, to get ready to um, have a profession. So I think this is a terrible place for a casino. Well, Joan, thank you for your call. And I'm sorry about the, the struggles that your family has been dealing with. So there are a couple different parts to that question. I wondered, um, maybe, Amy, you could talk about some of the issues that do come up with young people. Obviously, they're going to be getting ID going into the casino. And we could talk about that in a minute. But for people who do become dependent on casino, do develop an unhealthy relationship with it, is it more problematic when it starts out at a young age? Um, the data doesn't necessarily show that. It doesn't show that um, just because you've been exposed to gambling at a young age, you're going to definitely gamble when you're older, whereas the data shows that is the case with tobacco and drugs and alcohol. Um, you can form a gambling addiction at any age. Um, and so when we're talking about the college scene, if we're talking specifically like, uh, you know, Center County, um, the concern isn't just having a casino in the area, but college students are are at high risk for having a 
like problem with gaming, not just gambling, which is very similar. Video gaming disorder is very high right now, and we use our funding to help treat that as well. So people can seek treatment for video gaming disorder through 1-800-GAMBLER, just like they can if they have a gambling disorder from a casino or um, or some other form of gambling. So it's, it's definitely a concern, um, but most people can gamble responsibly. And we're taking a look at a graphic that has some of the warning signs. Is, is that right, Amy? Are these things that people can yeah. take a look for? Yeah, it's really important for individuals, if they're going to engage in gambling or gaming, to know what the risks are and what the signs of a problem are, and for family members to be able to recognize that as well. And so some of those signs of a problem gambling is the need to gamble more frequently, um, lying about where their money is going, uh, borrowing money to gamble, not being able to pay their bills or their expenses, um, if they get irritable or anxious, restlessness when they're unable to gamble, uh, chasing losses, um, and just isolation and distancing from family members. And we are going to go to another call in a minute, but really quickly here, Eric, I wondered if you could talk address that the IDing people issue. So what steps does a casino take to make sure that the people who are coming in are of age? Yeah, and, and this is, it varies a little bit by state to state. Um, different states have different roles. Um, in Pennsylvania, uh, there's extraordinarily uh, tight practices around ensuring that we never have anyone under the age of 21 come on the floor. Um, our security personnel undergo extensive training um, at uh, entrances, usually, uh, or almost, I think, all the time. Um, there is, you know, the, the best equipment for ID scanners so that we can make sure that even if someone has a fake ID uh, that tries to come in, that we can identify that. And, and, um, and this is where, you know, we work very closely with our regulators. And, and also, too, for the, for the casinos, the, the penalties are, are massive. So, uh, and, and, it, and it escalates for every instance of an underage gambler that finds their way onto the casino floor, the casinos are, are fined pretty significantly, which um, also drives uh, their their response to mitigate those issues. It's, it's something we take incredibly seriously as an industry and work very, very hard to ensure that no one underage gets on the casino floor. If you're just joining us, I'm Ann Danahy, and this is WPSU's Conversations Live. Tonight, we're talking about gambling and casinos in Pennsylvania, and we're ready to take your calls. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242. You can also send us questions by email at connect at WPSU.org. And we're going to go now to a phone call that we got, and this is from Horatio in State College. Hi, Horatio. You're on Hello. the air. Hi, Hi. thanks for calling. Do you can have a question? We can hear you. Do you have a question or comment? Yes, yes. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank you, the panel and the Director of Communications for the time they spent with us, as well as you, and the opportunity to voice my concern. It is actually a concern that I developed as I was listening to the program. I don't know if any of you has ever been left by themselves in a car, in a locked car, while your parents go somewhere to play uh, a game or, or for whatever reason. But it's a very distressing situation. And I personally wanted to ask, how, how can one put a, an amount of money, an amount of revenue, on the anguish of a child? That doesn't seem to make any sense to me. I really don't think this... this research and, and, and development as far as what we could do to alleviate the problem of gambling would exist if we didn't have gambling. So my question is this, how much money do we need so as to justify 11 cases per year of people left inside cars trapped while parents leave them? Well, Horatio, thank you very much for your call. And I don't know if any of our guests have anything else to add on the topic of uh, making sure that what casinos can do to make sure that that doesn't happen. Eric, we were talking a little bit about what casinos do do now as far as scouting out the parking lots or installing video cameras. I guess it raises the larger issue, philosophical issue of whether it's worth it. 
Well, the, it's not so much a philosophical, it's a very practical issue. When these things can scale into society, and when we mistreat children, children uh, grow into adults who also mistreat their children. So this is a cascading problem. It's more than a simple theoretical or philosophical question, even though I have been told more than once that I tend to look at things philosophically, so I apologize if that's the case. That's okay. I think it's very practical. I think, I mean, I, I all of, in my life experience tells me that violence cascades and cascades into unpredictable ways. So right. the question is this, why are we funding, why are we going to allow and allocate resources right. for activities that are self-defeating. Well, well, thank you, Horatio, for that call. I don't know if any of the guests, if you have anything to comment on that. Um, I think he mentioned the funding. Of course, the funding comes from private enterprises that would, would pay for it on that side of it. But um, put that out there. Any, any other comments on that? Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Horatio. And it looks like we do have another call, and this is from Mary in State College. Hi, Mary. Thank you for calling. And do you have a question or comment? I do. I have a question. Um, I think everyone knows that the house or the gambling uh, company always wins. And I just wondered how they set that up so they win. Um, does it have anything to do with a particular gambler making a tremendous amount of money and they cut them off? Uh, does the dealer have to be aware or without giving away any secrets, how does the house set it up so they win? Okay, well, thank you for that question. Eric, I don't know if you can give us any insider information on the behind the scenes. How does that work? Because, right, at the end of the day, the casino operator does not want to lose money. It's, uh, it's, a, question, it's a question that I get a lot. Um, and and my my canned response is if uh, if if I knew how to how to beat the house, I wouldn't be uh, sitting here talking to you. Um, uh, the the reality is is that um, uh, you know the the saying of the the house always wins is is a saying, but um, the reality of how of how all these games work is is the, these the the machines and the games are are, are very heavily regulated. Um, uh, you know, the, the caller is, is correct that they're, you know, the house, the casino does have a mathematical advantage over the long term on, on any game offered in a casino. Otherwise, um, they, they wouldn't exist. Um, uh, however, um, the vast majority of, of all the bets or all the wagers that are made are, are re returned, um, are, are paid back. Um, and it, if that wasn't the case, no one would would be uh, would go in the casino. So, um, you know, it's it's it, it is when it boils down to it, it's a it's a form of entertainment. Um, there there definitely are winners, and there definitely are you know people that, that don't have a winning experience uh, when they come in too. Um, but uh, you know, the games are, are are all very secure. It's it's not like uh, you know there's there's no uh, effects of you know, we don't track uh, players that come in and, and if they've had a, uh, you know, if they've won too much, we make it so that they lose. I mean, that's, that's not how any of, uh, that's not how any of this works. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for that insight into it. I want to go back to one of the topics that had, had come up a little bit before when we got a call from a mother concerned about young people becoming dependent on gambling. And it was mentioned the idea of now there's online gaming too. So even if you're in an area where there isn't a casino that a lot of young people are spending time online gambling or gaming, however you want to look at it. And Glenn, can you talk about that? I mean, is that a real cons growing concern? Because obviously people not just young people in general, spend a lot more time online. And then with the pandemic kind of compounding that. Yeah, happy to talk about that, Anne. And so that's one of the reasons that we're really excited about the ability to uh, have this assessment, right? So we, if we understand over time, uh, the amount of people who are engaged in this work, uh, who are engaged in this uh, activity, we can then hope to, uh, you know, again, help Amy and her office address any issues that we're noticing within the data that we're, we're uh, receiving. Um, one of the really important parts of the assessment is assessing problem gambling within those who engage in interactive gaming. Uh, we've, within our study thus far, in the group that we surveyed, 
uh, only about 2% of folks uh, contacted 1-800-GAMBLER. That's a good sign. That tells me that there's not a lot of individuals who believe that they have an issue with interactive, uh, in, uh, with problem gambling. Uh, but we are concerned because uh, we have a series of questions that are associated with behaviors that uh, are associated with uh, indicators that they might have a, an issue. And so we want to make sure that we're at least monitoring that over time. Uh, you know, just under a half, so about 45% of individuals indicated that they had at least one of those behaviors. And so if we can make sure that we are measuring this, understanding the impact of the availability of online gambling and interactive gaming over time, I think that this is going to make sure that we uh, have the appropriate prevention programs, intervention programs, uh, you know, access to 1-800-GAMBLER and the services there that are provided through the SCAs and uh, through the Department of Drug and Alcohol programs on the local scale. Uh, this is going to make sure that this doesn't have the deleterious effects that many people are, I think, are afraid of. And are you talking to people specifically in Pennsylvania? How is this working kind of logistically? Yeah, we've, we've been only focusing here on Pennsylvania. So this is a survey of Pennsylvanians. Uh, it's a representative sample of individuals across the entire Commonwealth. And through that representative sample, we have identified roughly about one in 10, so a little over 11% or so of individuals who have indicated that they have engaged in interactive gambling across uh, 2020 to 2021. So this is when we actually collect our data, uh, late 2020 to early 2021. And so right now we're actually in our second year of collecting this information, collecting this data of uh, residents. So if you're getting a call from Penn State asking you about uh, the uh, gambling behaviors in your household, please don't hang up. Please answer. We really appreciate your willingness to participate in this uh, online, this, uh, this phone survey. Uh, so just know that you'll be getting some, hopefully, uh, you know, a, a call from State College. But uh, the way that this actually works is then we take that information and we're going to follow this year after year after year. So this is a, an assessment that as long as uh, gambling online is available in Pennsylvania, we're going to be able to find ways to utilize this data to address any issues that come up across the now as well as into the future. Okay, that's great to know. So a long range study that'll keep providing that information, you'll be able to track it over time. And we do have a, a couple more phone calls coming in and we're going to go to Rick in Johnstown. Hi, Rick, thank you for calling. You're Hello. On... Hi, do you have a My question or comment? Yeah. Uh, um, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Rick. Yeah, my question is, well, I have two. But the first question is, anybody know roughly how much money is bet on, like the NFL, like each Sunday? Any, any ideas? Sports betting, NFL specifically, I do not know that number off the top of my head. Any other NFL sports bettors here who can help out with that question? No, I'm sorry, Rick, we can't answer that question. I do, I can tell you that the state is looking at gathering about $2 billion in tax revenues uh, this year. That's not an answer to your question, but it uh, does put some dollar on it. Okay, I'll just curious if they have dollar figures. Yeah, thank All you, right. though. And we do have another... All right, have a good night. You thank too. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have another call, and this is from Dave in State College. Hi, Dave, thanks for calling, and do you have a question or comment? Yes, I do. Um, I once worked at Harris Casino in Reno, Nevada, and it was very depressing to see the casino-funded busloads of pe poor people delivered to the casino doors every month on the days after welfare checks were delivered in Sacramento and San Francisco. And people would spend their welfare checks on gambling, and the odds favor the house on every bet. And the general public then would be stuck on paying their bills and feeding their families for the rest of the month. And will this proposed casino be permitted to entice the public from, say, Spring Mills and Phillipsburg and all these other areas with free bus tickets, a drink or two, and some wooden nickels to blow their welfare checks? Is that going to be permitted? Well, Dave, thanks for your call. I don't know if we're going to be able to answer it specifically about the proposed casino in State College. Eric is not here to represent that particular casino. He's here to, to speak for his business on his own behalf. But I don't know if Amy or Glenn can talk to the question more about who ends up with casino or gambling problems. Does it affect people who have less money disproportionately? 
Oh, well, yeah. the data shows uh, no, it affects everybody. Um, there are people who um, cannot afford treatment who make over six figures and have a gambling problem. So it, it affects everybody from every social economic background. Um, and I think it's important to note here that 85% of Pennsylvanians participate in gambling. All right. But only 4% of them actually end up with a problem gambling. So that's a small percentage. It's still too much. <laughs> you know, we, we don't want anyone to have a problem gambling, but most people can gamble responsibly. Um, and then the other thing to consider is that there is a lot of stigma associated with problem gambling. So people who do have a problem usually are not seeking help until their problem is very serious and they're facing jail time or eviction or bankruptcy. So people are not entering treatment as quickly as we'd like to see them enter it. Yeah, and I don't know, Glenn, do you have anything else you'd like to add to that? Yeah, the only thing that I would like to add here is that I think you know, Amy is really highlighting some important statistics and specifically noting that that stigma of getting into treatment is, is so prevalent. Um, unfortunately, we know that the best way to help people out is to help them early. And so by having data, by having assessments like the one that we're conducting, we're actually able to hopefully develop these interventions that will reach those who need it the most and at an earlier point rather than too far into their uh, issue associated with problem gambling that they're having all of this devastation that's surrounding them. So I, again, really want to focus here that having the data having early assessments, having an understanding of the uh, the ways in which people are engaging in, in gambling and in online gaming uh, is incredibly important for the work that Amy is doing. And Glenn, you had mentioned a list of questions that you asked earlier. Is that how you define what problem gaming, problem gambling is? Is there is there a specific definition for it? There is actually, you, Amy, do you wanna take this question? I think that you're probably the best <laughs> to answer that. <laughs> um, so basically a problem gambling is any kind of gambling or gaming behavior that disrupts an individual's personal life, their family life, or their work or their success at work or school. So we went over the signs and um, it can be different for everybody as, as to what is a problem and what makes it severe. So the problem is, the question is how it's impacting their lives and the lives of those around them. We, mm -hmm. we do have one more question, and this is from Mary Ellen, and she writes, how will casino jobs positively impact the area? What are the wages offered for most positions in the casino? And she's probably talking about the state college proposed casino, but Eric, maybe you can talk about generally how many jobs does a typical mini casino, like the one that's been proposed for Center County, bring with it, and is there a, a typical salary? Yeah, so it's from uh, in terms of, of overall positions, and it varies a little bit, but it's it's right around that 400, uh, 400 number. Um, so it's it's a significant amount of jobs, um, and and you know I can I, I started in this business bussing tables uh, at a casino in Laughlin, Nevada, and have have worked in the industry uh, ever since, and have been able to work my way up through the industry. One of the things that I think is great about it is pretty much no matter what you're interested in, and it could be, you know, maybe you come in as a waiter or a bus boy or in the facilities crew or anything like that. Um, in most cases, if you are interested in a, in a discipline that's, that's beyond that, it could be accounting, it could be IT, it could be um, uh, electrical trades, it could be really anything, chances are there are positions and there's a pathway to grow uh, within the industry. And it's, it's, I did it personally, and I'm not a unique example of that. I went from busboy to casino CEO. And um, a lot of my peers had similar paths. And I think that's one of the great things about this is that it gives opportunities to folks that, you know, maybe uh, don't have, you know, didn't have an opportunity to get a college degree or, or something like that. You know, regular folks that, that uh, uh, you know, can, can start off and, and work their way up. And there are significant opportunities. Um, they're typically very competitive wages uh, across the board. Um, casinos typically offer excellent benefits packages and, and are, are for the most part, great places to work. And, and that's something we're very proud of as an industry. And, and it's, it's a thing that's, that's kept me engaged and 
uh, a new casino development going anywhere, I think would, would benefit the community goes in in those ways. Well, Eric, we have about a minute left, and I don't know if this is a, the type of question that you can answer in a minute or less, but I wonder, how does the industry decide where it's going to situate a casino? Because I'm looking at Pennsylvania and thinking there's a lot of casinos, you know, around the edge of the state, but not really any in the central, north central part of the state. So how does an operator decide where a good fit is? Well, uh, they'd start doing exactly what you described. Uh, look at a map first and, and uh, see if there are areas of, of opportunity. Um, you know, casinos are significant, massive investments. Um, even the smaller category four casinos, these mini casinos, um, you know, none of them, I, to my knowledge, are under $100 million to build and develop, and, and most are significantly more than that. And those are for the smallest examples. Um, a lot of the resort casinos are hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. So if, if it's a casino operating company or developers looking to do this, um, obviously, there are, it's a, it's a massive investment. So a lot of time and research goes into making sure that there's a, a population that um, would uh, fit in with with that development, and right. and uh, you know it's it's right. I don't know if I can sum that up in a minute, but it is definitely a very involved process. Well, yeah, thank you for trying, and Glenn Sterner, Amy Howard, and Eric Pearson, thank you all three of you for joining us and for fielding the questions. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you so much for having us. We've been talking with Glenn Sterner, an assistant professor of criminal justice at Penn State Abington, Amy Hubbard with the Compulsive Problem Gambling Section in the State Drug and Alcohol Programs, and Eric Pearson, founder of Copper Star Gaming. Our next episode of Conversations Live will be on February 24th, where we'll talk about healthy aging. Thank you for watching and listening to WPSU's Conversations Live.